After you hit that subscribe bell, be sure to head over to Sportscaster and join us every Saturday at 8 a.m. You can give that one a shot again. Ladies and gentlemen, for another morning, I am being joined by a very special guest. If you're in any of the Bills circles of individuals that cover the Buffalo Bills, talk about the Buffalo Bills, you have to follow this guy. I'm sure you already do. His name is Greg Tomset of Cover One. I'm very happy that Hashtag Sports has him on today. Greg, how are you doing this morning? Good, good. Really excited. Uh, looking forward to uh, coming on here and talking about all the fun things that have been going on. Absolutely. I think it's – I don't think I've seen a team, well, as far as the fan base goes, with this much excitement going into the season. I think that's because of the – number 17 under center you know what i mean yeah it's 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 dangerous i spend a lot of time mm -hmm. managing expectations <laughs> and, <laughs> and trying to settle people down but i can't lie it, it's it, there's some legitimate excitement there's a reason to be optimistic and it's a it's a foreign feeling for most of us so i, I try to i try to be a little bit careful <laughs> i think it, it ranges between that one uh that one kid, the gif of the hockey kid who's just like screaming at the hockey game <laughs> yes oh my god <laughs> Yeah, we got a quarterback. All right. You know, Josh Allen is progressing. He's also progressing talking with the media. And I, I guess you just had an incident not too long ago with some, you know, you know Allen signing all these autographs. So did you have like an a instance with somebody with autographs that – yeah, so it's a little weird. And most of my interaction was online. So, but I will say, okay. uh, so I went to camp last week. Last weekend, I was there for both Saturday and Sunday sessions. And it's hysterical. Where you know, as practice wraps up, you get to the point where the players are starting to stretch and do some of their team meeting things. And everybody realizes, okay, practice is over. So most people are getting up to leave. But there's these groups of people shoving to the front, trying to get right up against the railing to try to get autographs. And you know, some of them, it's a kid with a little mini helmet or his jersey or a hat or whatever and that's great that's a really sweet um you know scenario that i i can remember wanting to do that and get you know jim kelly or steve tasker or whoever you know cornelius bennett's autograph and wanting to go through and do that but some of them there's guys with just bags or like double fisted items of trying to get as much stuff signed as possible and it just comes off a little weird. So I, I had that experience <laughs> and, you know, Aaron and I are kind of talking about it. I'm like, yeah, that's just not my thing. I, I don't really get it, but whatever. And then all of a sudden I get online last night and people start arguing about it. And there's this <laughs> huge debate. I think it was with Ryan Talbot from upstate kind of started it. Yeah. And one guy in particular, I'm not going to blow him up. I, I, he doesn't deserve that started to go in on, man, I can't believe that some of these players are skipping over adults and just signing for kids. You know, we buy their merchandise. It's the least they can do to sign these things. Wow. And that guy got lit up. It was in a, like, I get it. That I, I went into him pretty hard and, and felt a little bit bad afterwards. But <laughs> um, there were a couple adults that said, hey, you know, I get it. And I'm totally fine if, you know, some players have a kids only policy, but you know, I, it's my first time here. I've been a fan for 15 years. I drove out here. I waited in line. I let kids jump in front of me, but when he got to me, I was kind of hoping he would sign my thing too. And he just skipped over me and went to the next kid. And I said, all right, I get it. I get that. That's kind of deflating. You're also an adult and it's not that big of a deal and you're okay, but all right. I get it, but you realize that it's the other sleazy adults that ruin this for you, not the athlete who has the kids only policy, right? Yeah. So that was kind of my walk away is that okay, I get it. Not everybody that's doing this is some sleaze ball or weirdo trying to, you know, hawk things on eBay, but that you realize those are the guys that ruin this, not the athletes who now just sign for kids. We had a discussion one time, a bunch of my buddies, and it was about buying a jersey. If if the player's younger than you, it's just kind of weird if you buy a jersey. <laughs> and we, I was discussing it, and at the time, I was like, I think I was like 38 years old. And I go, yeah. oh, boy, I can never buy a jersey again. Like, yeah. well, Favre's not coming back. I'm not going to buy that one. Well, it's so funny. I, I'm in the exact same situation. I, I'm actually 38 right now. Um, and <laughs> I had that comment last night that the Hall of Fame made me feel weird because now it's to the point where I remember Champ Bailey and Tony Gonzalez and Ed oh, Reed yeah. in college – and, you know, scouting them going into the draft and then their entire career and now their retirement and now in the Hall of Fame and now having like that full window where I remember every single phase of that. And I'm like, holy crap, I'm old. 
<laughs> I'm in, yeah. I'm in my third year of that, Greg. So until you get to me, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. You know, that being said, uh, like I said, give Greg a, a follow. He does great work for cover one, him and Aaron Quinn. Uh, the thing that's going on with this Bills team, I think the, the biggest question mark is everyone's so excited. Everyone's, you know, really, you know, excited for the season to start and Allen to do his thing. And they got all these new toys on offense. One of the new toys they have on offense, Mitch Morse, a little bit concerning what's going on with him. And he's in the concussion protocol. He's been working, you know, in, doing individual drills by himself. Uh, what is your take on the Mitch Morse situation? What's going on? And what are some, some ways that the Bills could remedy this situation that's going on? So I think that there's a couple different ways to look at this. I said, one, I think some have gone way overboard and are literally already, I get questions on there. I, I spend a lot of time in my personal uh, professional life. Uh, I do a lot of financial analysis and things like that. So I end up gravitating towards some of the over the cap and spot track websites. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. good with, you know, cap impact or things. And I'm already getting questions of people being like, Oh man, how quick can we get out of this deal? You know, and already to the point, Oh man, what a, what a bust. I can't believe that they signed this guy. They knew the risk going in. This is such a disaster. And I, I just want to, you know, dial it back a little bit. Like it, it's not, this isn't great news. There's no scenario where this is good, no. but he's already doing sled work. He's already doing high end conditioning work. So he's already a pretty good chunk of the way through here. This is not the severity that, you know, he has to be locked away in a dark room and can't have light or noise. <laughs> like there are very serious concussions that put people out for extended periods of time and we have no idea what this is but it doesn't appear to be that i would assume that they're just taking this incredibly cautiously and I, would i prefer that it never happened absolutely yeah. but i there's a perfectly reasonable possibility that he comes out and plays all 16 games like that that is absolutely within yeah. the realm of possibility here including playing in a week or two here to get in a, a preseason game for some live reps and then you know that's probably my goal is that we don't play him in the first or second preseason game you give him a series or two in the third preseason game to get a couple live bullets and then put him away and you walk him out there for week one ready to go so th that's kind of my timeline i would hope for here um but the people who have already jumped to the the kind of mindset that oh my gosh this is a disaster they knew what we were walking into i can't believe they did this what a bust you know dial it back a little bit come on man being someone who has played i haven't played at that level but having concussions and knowing how they accumulate sure. they're come they're uh, cumulative so i understand that and uh, i had a talk with uh, rico from buffalo fanatics and we were talking about if i was the 20 year old me what i was i would have told him hey get back out there throw some dirt on it you know but i'm you know being 40 years old i'm like okay i'm wondering about the welfare of this guy and what's going yeah. on and i'm sure the bills understood this as well by giving him a you know you know he had that four four year 44 million dollar contract well you know a lot of those things were built into the contract to protect the bills for this scenario because he did have concussion history over the past two years he did only play 18 games so i understand that perspective the bills protected themselves a little bit and they they did what they had to do with the contract to get him here and to get him to protect their uh first round investment of last season in josh allen we actually went into that on the show because, I, like I said, I, I don't think that's the case. But in full due diligence, yeah. the team can get out of this in two years. He's on this roster for two years no matter what. There are some escalators where he wouldn't make quite as much money in those first two years. But there is a scenario where if, God forbid, the worst case scenario happened, he doesn't ever play a snap for the Buffalo Bills. He'd still be on this roster for two years because it costs more to get rid of him than it does to simply keep him on the sideline on, on injured reserve. Um, but in theory, they could walk away after two years <clears throat> and start from scratch. I, I don't think that's even reasonably possible. Like, I, I can't say there's zero poss percent possibility. I don't think that's really possible. But in theory, they could walk away from that. And Brandon Bean has shown a propensity for you know, having team friendly terms. Yeah, they did. And, and I'm looking at, like, I'm looking at it right now, as far as that's concerned, if they would, they would have to take a, uh, you know, $10 million dead money bomb, only saving 1.3 uh, next as, year, as far as next year goes. Okay. So while I agree with you in the fact that I think he's going to be on this team this year, I think it's, let's get foregone conclusion. And we're jumping to conclusions anyway, depending on the severity of the concussion. Um, he's on the team this year, but I think the bills next year, if he, shows that he's not able to go i mean 
I don't see a lot of dead money in Brandon B making bad deals with this team. So they could take that hit if they needed to, as far as that $9 million uh, dead money bomb with Mitch Morris. Just, I don't, I don't see the, the benefit of keeping him on the team. I know from a financial standpoint that it is, but the you're taking away a guy for your team. And yeah, fi- you're playing with 52, to, basically. Yeah, it would have to get to the point where he was literally in an Eric Wood situation yes, where yeah. he was, for all intents and purposes, retired, but can't say that word because if you say that word, then you give up some of the guaranteed money and you kind of <laughs> fort and you kind of fort. Yeah, it's exactly literally what happened at his press conference is the NFL Players Association came out and said, listen, you can't come out and do a press conference and say the word retired because if you do, you're going to let the Bills, you know, recoup the guaranteed money that they still owe you you need to force them to reach an injury settlement and release you and he would be in the exact same scenario so the only scenario is like you said he's a grown man he has a wife and kids and if they got to the point where they said wow a fourth concussion is the real deal yeah and again i want to preface this for any fans who want to take a snippet of this and say oh greg said he was going to retire that's not what we're saying here (laughs) but i will say Let's say he comes back in two weeks. He They give him two more weeks of kind of getting into the motions. He goes through all the protocol. Yep. And that first practice he comes out, he gets another one. You know, that, that would be the scenario in my mind where they would have to take back and really take stock of, from a personal standpoint of yeah. what are we doing here? If that happened, you know, God forbid, I, I hope that does not happen from a personal standpoint, not the, just from a Bills and fan standpoint, but from a personal standpoint, I don't wish that upon anyone. Yeah. But if that happened, where they went through all the protocol, he walks out there, and the very first full contact practice he does, he gets another one, where they have to question, am I ever going to be able to do this again? If that happened, then yes, I agree that they would have to work a way to get out of this after this year. There's no, they literally can't get out of it this year. It would hurt them to get out of it this year. But next year, after you got to March 1st, they could do that. And there's enough cap space next year where they could make that work. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think that's what they're looking at here. I think that it'd be much more likely of a, um, he's still working to come back and wanting to get in. He's only, you know, he's only 26, 27. He he, he, he wants to play football. He wants to do this. And he also wasn't that high of a draft pick. So you have to remember he isn't a, you know, super rich NFL athlete who has a ton of cushion. This deal is the life-changing generational money that he has not gotten yet. So mm-hmm. he has a vested interest in seeing all four of these years, and that sets up his kids, kids, kids for with money down the line. Mm-hmm. He hasn't earned that kind of money yet. He's now... Well, he's got certain, about... Uh, he's a well-off right person. Yeah. yeah, he's a well-off person, but he's not, you know wealthy to never have to work again that's what this contract does for him so he has a vested interest in seeing this contract through all four years my my million dollar question for you greg is in the unlikely event that mitch morse is misses to, let's say he plays six seven games okay. all right so obviously he's the quarterback of that line you want him in there to get everyone where they need to go and i thought it was i think it's just so interesting with all the connections between mahomes that people the bills fans but between home mahomes and allen now Allen has his center from last year. I just thought it was pretty hysterical. Oh, um, yeah. I think he was underrated in how good that offense was last year. Oh, yeah. So the million-dollar question is that if he happens to miss any kind of extended period of time, what is your solution to this offensive line at center, and then how much does that affect the surrounding parts? So I think it's an interesting question because God forbid that answer be Russell Bodine. I I hope to God it's not that. Um, So let's dismiss that one initially. He's been getting a fair amount of the reps now, and I'm going to lead into the fact of why that's a good thing from Mm -hmm. a Mitch Morris standpoint Mm -hmm. in in a moment. I think the answer is pretty clearly John Feliciano, 70%, Spencer Long, 25%, Russell Bodine, 5%. I think Spencer Long got a hard time last year because he did have a, in, a incredibly bad game where he tried to be the center with a dislocated finger and he had like five or six bad snaps and I think caused two or three fumbles. And I think that got rattled around in the NFL Twitter echo chamber as though <laughs> he's a horrible center. And dude, the guy tried to gut it out playing center with a dislocated finger and he was dumb and shouldn't have, but that doesn't mean it's not 
possible. Yeah. Now, most grades say that he's a better guard than a center. So I'm going to trust that. Okay. And, I, and I'm going to say that I believe John Feliciano is the answer to that. He was the first guy who got a rep when Mitch Morris was out. He was the, the first team center when that was going on. And now when he was interviewed, I think it was John Wauro with the uh, Associated Press asked him, you know, what's going on there? And he said, no, my number one focus is winning the right guard spot. I'm going to say that's a good thing because the team wouldn't give him that option if their mindset was, holy shit, what are we going to do if Mitch Morris is gone? <laughs> we have we have to get John Feliciano over there immediately. They would simply have him prepping as the center. So the fact that they're still letting Spencer Long and John Feliciano take reps at guard and continue to practice at guard – I think is their indication that they don't see this as a long-term thing for Mitch Morris. They still have full confidence that he's going to be back, that he's already in the third or the fourth step out of five in the concussion protocol is that that's their tell their slight sign to us um, that they're not long-term concerned yet. Not that that can't change, yeah. but right now, because if they were, they would have Feliciano working exclusively at center from day one, not competing at right guard. Yeah, I think the relationship that uh, Feliciano has with uh, I, be call, I, I can't I can't resist to call him OG Bobby Johnson every time. <laughs> uh, the relationship he has is able to communicate things across that line. I understand why that makes sense with Feliciano going to center. Uh, the combinations that they're able to play with, I think, will ultimately tell you. I mean, having four centers is a good problem to have. Number one. I mean, if you want to talk about yeah. Bodine, and this is why rosters are at ninety. I mean, when they got long and they got uh, when they got long and then they signed Morris, you thought, oh, why didn't they cut Bodine yet? Well, he's on an affordable deal, and you can never have too many centers. So, and the you the financial benefit is the exact same on September first as it was on March fifteenth. Yep. All the people that were calling for Vlad Dukas and Russell Bodine and whoever to be released day one. Mm -hmm. There's no benefit to that because you get the exact same cap savings waiting through camp, making sure that you didn't get an injury. And any of those guys you released, you would have just had to go out and find another Isaac Asiata type player yeah. that filled a DeAndre Wesley. Like you still needed a camp body to take snaps and to play fourth quarters of preseason games. So, you know, there's no benefit of doing that. And if fans get a little, I think they play around on the websites or they're used to running their Madden uh, franchises <laughs> that, that they make their releases on day one. And it's just, you still have to run a functional locker room and camp yeah. to take those snaps. And I don't expect them to make the roster, but they have a benefit being on the team today. Yeah. And those are those things that we're just not privy to as far as with the, with the inside the locker room, what goes on in, in the team. Uh, as far as, you know, I'll just bring up a guy, Patrick DeMarco, everyone's calling for his head and oh, makes crazy. we don't know about, the amount of leadership this guy provides within the locker room behind closed doors and everything like that. But that, that notwithstanding you, you come over to the offensive line. Now you have Feliciano playing at center. And then do they, do they feel though, could this be a scenario where they feel that the combination of Bodine and Feliciano is stronger than Feliciano at center and long at right guard? Or is that, do you think that's playing a part in their mind? Like, okay, we got Feliciano. If we need him in emergency, like in case of emergency break glass, we're going to, we're going to have to do this if Morse is out, but who are we going to put in that right guard spot? Well, Bodine could do it. And then Feliciano could still make the calls at right guard if he had to as a center. So I'm hoping that that's not the case because I, I, I think fans have assumed that because we've seen these first two weeks of practices and them getting a long look at Cody Ford at right tackle means that he's only being considered to play right tackle. I've made this point a couple times on the show that I think they had years of NFL film on Ty and Secchi and knew exactly what they were getting. They oh, knew yeah. the caliber he was. They knew what he was capable of. They didn't necessarily need to test that out to know that he could play right tackle or left tackle when needed at a starting caliber, which is why they gave him 7 million a year. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that with Cody Ford because he had only played in college and they needed an extended look to get there. And they had hedged the whole time that, Hey, we're going to be open to playing him at guard, but we wanted, we don't want to put too much on his plate at, at one given time. I don't see any scenario where two of the best five Buffalo Bills offensive linemen do not involve both Ty Inseki and Cody Ford. So Ooh. I assume that at some point here, and I think it could be as soon as after this first preseason game, I think they're going to let Cody Ford get some reps at, at right tackle. 
I do, I think that he has the chance to be a dominant, all, le- legitimately all pro level guard because he is a monster in the phone booth. <laughs> but but the thing that when you put him out isolated on the edge, his his least best trait is his footwork. He just doesn't have delicate, quick footwork. He's kind of a big plodding grizzly bear but if he gets his hands on you the get the day's over but yeah. when you put him out there isolated at tackle it kind of exposes that a little bit more i think you can protect that by moving him into guard let him just focus on the things that he's great at and let him be really good there and then let ty and Seki play right tackle next to him and as you give cody ford a year or two ideally that's our right side for the next two years mm-hmm. you let cody ford get used to an nfl nutrition program and quickness and plyogenics and and uh nfl workout schedule and get used to that work on his technique and then long term he can still be your right tackle but i think in the short term that's our right side and then you're worrying about john feliciano and spencer long are the interior backup guys in all three spots both can play center both can play guard and then they're there to fill in if, again, God forbid, Mitch Morris isn't available. But ideally, they're just really high-end, good quality backups. That's my ideal scenario. It's funny. I mean, that's that's great because I have a completely different one. Um, and that's 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 part of the brilliance of this is that you know, you know, we could we could take all the information that we're given, things that are happening at camp, things that are going on, contracts. You know, not many people pay attention to the contracts with the Ty and Seki deal is that he's paid to be a starter. He's paid as, like, he was a starter. Now, were the Buffalo Bills just offering him that because that's what he was being offered, and they wanted to make sure they got him in here because they didn't know how the draft was going to play out with the tackle? That, Who knows? The that, that's the key you just mm-hmm. said. you got to remember, they signed him two months before they realized Cody Ford was going to be available in the second round. Exactly. I mean, the way that I that I had it as far as the offensive line goes. Now, truth be told, a lot of the scenarios that happen in the NFL – if a, if a player is struggling at tackle, as you're saying, you know, with the lateral movement of a Cody Ford, they happen to slide into guard. And that's that seems to be the mold that goes on. We see it on defense all the time. A cornerback gets up there in age usually, and then he shifts over to safety because he knows the game. Uh, very rarely, though, do you see a guy who is going to be playing at guard for a few years and then kick out to tackle. I mean, I, I, I can't remember one scenario that is. Not that I'm saying – I'm not trying to debunk your – your scenario, I think that side of the line would be ridiculous if that's what you had over there. If you have Feliciano or Morse at center, then you have Ford and Maseki on your right side. Um, that is a force to be reckoned with. I, I don't even know many teams in the league that could be able to mess with that side of the line. And I do agree with you 100% on if Ford gets his hands on you, just call it a day. I mean, you just, just forget it. It's done. Yeah, Um, I'll give you two quick ones um, that are recent ones that are here. And again, I I think you're right in general that most guys, if you're going to be a good tackle, you're probably a good tackle from day one. And that's, I think, very much has to do with the footwork that's there. Because if you're a Tyron Smith, you're a good you have good footwork and technique from day one. But here's two recent ones. So the Colt, the Colt started out Braden Smith in at guard and Mm. had him work last year for the first full game. Now we're making him the end of the second half of the year at right goal and he's going to this year right tackle and he's done well. The best example is Laramie Tunsil down in Miami who played his first year yep. at guard, now is kicked out to left tackle and is by some people's measure one of the best young left tackles in the NFL. So our guys who have made that transition successfully because there was an established guy in the team for him more so than the guy – wasn't quite ready so i think we have a mix of that where hey we can protect we can protect him a little bit it's what he's maybe not quite the best at yet but we also can get value from him day one rather than having a really valuable first round caliber guy just sitting on the bench when we're probably starting a you know feliciano Spencer long better than we had last but they're not of his caliber um so i I think the path to that but uh, aaron has brought this up on our show i respect the fact that there are people who say, hey, if his long-term value is at right tackle, get him every single rep there because long-term, that's where we get the best benefit from him. And I get that, and I'll respect that if that's what Bobby Johnson and, and Brian Day will walk away from. To to your point, I, I believe Tunsil was a tackle all along. I think he had the footwork and the strength and everything. I think that was the decision by the Dolphins was to move him inside and have him, do, and have him work there for a year, and I understand that. Um, I mean, we've seen – 
we've seen decisions made all over the NFL where it's like, why are they putting this guy here? It doesn't make any sense. And then they move him to a different system or a different position, and he ends up thriving. Uh, with Tunsil, I, like I said, my personal opinion, I thought he he was an amazing steal for the Dolphins at, at either tackle that they wanted to put him at. Now, the decision they made to put him at guard, okay, you want to give him some reps at guard, that's great. To And like you said, to your point, you get Ford. A lot of these rookies that are coming in, they haven't had an offseason yet. They went right from – you know, college, they were preparing for the combine, they prepare for the draft, they come into, you know, uh, OTAs, now they're here. They don't have time, they don't have an off season. You know, we've seen what happens when, when players transition from year one to year two, how that's going to go and how Ford can benefit from that going into next year. It, now, if they make a decision to move him to right guard, I mean, I would not, it's not hateful. Like I said, I love your scenario in, in having that, that right side of the line. I only, my only difference was that I had Naseki not going to right tackle, I had him going to left. And okay, I, I've my, seen I've seen that path. I've seen that. Yeah, path. and and I got I got torched for it on on social media. Which okay, it was just an opinion of mine. Which what I've seen uh, over the past couple of years. Now, your, I think the reason the people that that talk to you that say hey, if he's going to be your right tackle, a long term right tackle, get him as many reps as they as you can. I think that's just, that's the path that they took with Dawkins, which is why it makes sense for Ford to take that same path. If he's going to be your right tackle, if you draft him to be your right tackle, 10,000 reps, McDermott preaches that, 10,000 reps, 10,000 reps. Get him over there as fast as possible, just like they're doing with Dawkins on the left side. Listen, it's his job to lose. If he doesn't perform up to up to snuff, we're going to have to – we have Niseki there as an insurance policy for either tackle. I, I, think, it, it, I think that's actually – much more reasonable than many fans are viewing it. And that doesn't mean that Deion Dawkins is a bust because honestly coming out, the scouting reports on Deion Dawkins and Cody Ford weren't terribly dissimilar in that both of them had comments, I think specifically from Mike, uh, from uh, McCoy uh, on the, um, on the uh, NFL network saying that they both could play tackle, but might be a dominant level guard. Yeah. That was really similar to what you heard from Deion Dawkins. So that's not some, admission of failure and that it automatically means he's a bust it might just be coming to terms with the fact that he could be an average tackle or an above average guard and we'll take the above average guard oh my god can you imagine can you imagine him sliding Dawkins and Ford down to guards and putting Morse in the middle of them oh man and so I think we're one Ooh tackle short of that i don't yeah, think i'm yeah. ready to start later in waddle I, I don't think which is what um, i was gonna say it's amazing that name hasn't come up for a guy who him and his wife have, have entrenched themselves in the Buffalo <laughs> community no one's talking about waddle on his team yeah i i think that he's he is the ultimate sign of the luxury that Brandon Bean built for us here oh, where yeah. last year we would have been begging for him to start. And now <laughs> he's just kind of seen as this luxury swing tackle that we don't really have to worry about. And that ideally he's our, you know, eighth lineman. And that, you know, in my scenario, let's say that more, uh, again, Morris is healthy. I think we walk into game day Dawkins at left tackle, Quentin spare, uh, Quentin Spain at left guard, Morris at center, Cody Ford at right guard, uh, Ty and Secchi at right tackle are two interior backups on game day are Spencer Long and uh, John Feliciano. Our game day swing tackle is later in Waddle. And then Wyatt Teller is our ninth offensive lineman who's probably game day inactive. I, I think that's how things are shaking out right now, unless Morse is the long is long term injured, in which case Russell Bodon probably makes the roster. And my guess is. Wyatt Teller may not and might get pushed to practice squad. He does I don't, have eligibility. He does. He does. Yeah. There, I think there's too much depth at running back and tight end and defensive back and linebacker that we can't keep 10 offensive linemen. So that that's yeah. where I think it would shake out. And that way then again, Larry Dernwado, I think is a valuable game day sixth lineman to come in or whatever. Um, but yeah, it is kind of funny that last year we would have been begging for him to come in and start. And now yeah. I don't think I've seen any scenario where people are projecting him as a starter. It's amazing how the the performance of Cody Ford uh, and the contract of Ty Niseki are both going to determine Adrian Waddle's fate on this team. Like you said, if, if Niseki ends up starting, then you need a swing tackle. If Ford starts, you're, you're keeping a $7 million investment on the bench and it doesn't make sense to do that. So what, what do you do in that, in that scenario? And even in your scenario, you talk about an embarrassment of riches. 
you're not even starting Feliciano. And he's a guy that could start on this team. And for last year, we'd be begging for him. Oh, man, I wish we had Feliciano last year. That would have been great, you know? I, I love the scenarios that you have. And, and it would not be a hateful lineup coming into the season, I think. It is a 1,000% improvement over what Josh Allen had in front of him last year. And I think all Bills fans can agree that's 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 the that's the goal I think uh, being had going into this offseason was to try to get some depth at offensive line, quality depth at the offensive line. So. Yeah, and, and I think that no matter what, <clears throat> I don't think we're going to roll out the Dallas Cowboys lineup of three all pros and five first round picks. That's not going to be our scenario <laughs> under any circumstance. But no matter what, our sixth, seventh, and eighth linemen are going to be significantly better than what we had last year. So that if we have an injury, if we have something else pop up, I think that we're going to be in much better shape that we have legit competition and that the drop off from Quentin Spain to John Feliciano from Spencer long to your, or from Feliciano to Spencer long from Inseki to Cody Ford. It's not going to be a material difference. The, sadly, the one where there's a material difference is the one that's out right now with Mitch Morris. But all other, <laughs> all the other four positions, I don't think there's a big difference. If Ty Insecki has to step in for Deion Dawkins at left tackle, I don't think we skip a beat. Um, so every other spot other than center, I think that we can make an adjustment, bring in that sixth, seventh, or eighth man, and not really have anything drop off. And that's a luxury we haven't had in a long, long time. Yeah. Now, keep it with that theme. Keep with that theme talking about the big uglies. Can we go over to the other side of the ball real quick? Sure, sure. All right. So if we're talking about these guys on the offensive side of the ball. Now we go over to the defensive side of the ball. We talked about Cody Ford. We talked about how this the offensive line has depth and everything that's going on with the offensive line. We go over to the other rookie, the other defensive lineman, the monster, who is surprisingly only 275 pounds at the moment in Ed Oliver. And – the way that this defense, Leslie Frazier, Sean McDermott, has set it have set it up, a lot of people were concerned throughout the first week of camp. You know, he's not he's not starting. He's not starting. He's on the second team. He's on the second team. This guy's got to learn techniques. This guy has been bowling people over at Houston for for years. And I, I love the retweet you put out of him. Uh, wait, let me check the stats. Uh, this guy's 6'7", 330. He Reggie Whited him. <laughs> so he just yeah. threw him out of the way. What concerns, if any, do you have? Ed Oliver to make his transition to an NFL game and to potentially be the starter in between Star Latula Lay and Jerry Hughes. Yeah, I can't lie. I'm having a hard time remaining reasonable every <laughs> every other Ed Oliver highlight that comes out. I, I'm having a real hard time trying to manage expectations here because obviously your number one fear when you draft a guy who's six one to let's say 280 but probably 275 and i think he played some games last year at probably 272 yeah. um that obviously your fear is that he's going to get washed out by the quentin spains of the world I, if anyone who hasn't seen quentin spain i saw him in person in in uh training camp you can't convince me that they just didn't put a football jersey over a refrigerator <laughs> um he is the thickest human i've ever seen in my entire life i don't understand like he looks like a guy who shouldn't be able to move and is just insanely morbidly obese. And then he get <laughs> he gets down his stance and explodes out and it's crazy. I like, went I to I went to I camp the one it. I know I went to camp the one Friday and I was looking on the side I was on the, the fan sideline and I look and I was like, Who parked a Buick on the sideline? What's going Dude, on? He, he is, is so massive. Big. So that kind of guy is what you fear is going to wash out um, a player of the quickness of uh, Ed Oliver. But what we've seen is, I mean, Ed Oliver is so thick and powerful that it kind of belies his size and allows him to maintain that. And then the plays where, again, let's flip it around. A guy like Quentin Spain is trying to beat Ed Oliver to the gap. It's just not possible. Like yeah. he can't get there fast enough. And Ed Oliver is now getting to the point where they're kind of letting him loose and he is just destroying practices. And it's, it's come up now that they've given Feliciano days off and Mitch Morris is out. And I would expect Ed Oliver to ruin Russell Bodine. That's, that's not some enormous victory, but just the fact that he is, is showing that, you know, man, we really might be onto something special here. And that, it, especially, I actually love the idea 
that they're making him earn every rep. They're not, they're not handing him the starting job. And the fact that, you know, people have to remember the, even Aaron Donald uh, guys don't, the NFL defenses don't plug in a guy at defensive tackle and say, Hey, you're our starter. You play every snap. Like you might a Micah Hyde or a Trey white or a Tremaine Edmonds. That's not feasible in the trenches. The best defensive lineman like Fletcher Cox plays like 77% of the snaps. Um, lots of re- too. really, really good. You know, that's actually in crazy high. Yeah. Lots of really, really good defensive tackles play 65% of the snaps. So as a rookie, I love the fact that we can roll out Jordan Phillips and Ed Oliver at 50 50 of the snaps, keep them fresh, yeah. let him work on his technique and just go in and destroy stuff when you're in there, then take a, take a drive off and get ready and do it again. That's a huge luxury and a bonus. That's not a negative that Ed Oliver is not going to play a hundred percent of the snaps. That's a great process and, and great problem to have. So I love the fact that we can deploy him intelligently and carefully. And if we're being smart about it, what probably makes more sense on first down if we think the team's going to run? Wouldn't you kind of rather have Star Latule and Jordan Phillips out there? And then on second and third down, you bring in your Ed Oliver to let him penetrate and ruin the pass play. So I actually think it makes more sense not to start him, but he might play the most important high leverage snaps as the game goes on. So I think they can be smart about how they do it. Absolutely. I mean, with the rotational front that the Buffalo Bills play, it, it's it, to me, whoever starts it, is irrelevant for me because, all right, if you had a guy like Fletcher Cox, I guess it would be a concern. Well, oh, Oliver's only going to play 30%, 29% of the snaps. Doesn't make any sense. But the way that they play the rotational front, he's going to, he's definitely going to get his looks. He's definitely going to be in there. And I understand that. And that's fine. Uh, you, you were talking about having to contain your excitement for watching <laughs> Oliver and all this stuff. I, on one of our shows, you know, because I, I happen to think that. And a very important piece, a very important cog of this off of this defensive line is Starla Tulele. And no one else thinks so. Everyone thinks he's overpaid. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't get all these stats and everything. And I understand it. But I what I did was I compared it maybe prematurely, and I don't know how this is very premature. I compared it to the and Dominican Sue Aaron Donald. You you mentioned Donald just a minute ago. Well, Donald was able to be that successful, number one, because he's a monster. And we're starting to see flashes of that from Oliver. But and Dominican Sue was taking on those double teams for him so he could be one on one. So he could be, he, so he could do a lot of those things. And I think that's maybe I made up uh, that comparison a little too premature as far as Sue and Donald versus Oliver and Starr. But that's what I see. I see one guy who's just going to eat bodies and another guy who's going to use his speed and quickness to get into the, to push the pocket in the front because Frazier and McDermott. I don't say that they don't like blitzing, but they would rather beat you playing, you know, just rushing four and playing seven across. I understand that. Um, but shifting it over to what Oliver brings to your team and uh, how he's he he's playing a different position. A lot of people don't realize that. And I think that's some of the things that get lost in the mix. Oh, he went to the second team. You're making him earn it. Why don't you make Cody Ford earn it? Well, look at this defensive line. Look at the offensive line. All right two vastly different areas, you know, two different ends of the spectrum. But if you're talking about Oliver, the guy played a zero technique. Now he has to go play a three technique. People don't realize that's a different position. You have different responsibilities and the things you're asked to do as far as from a defensive front. And this is the reason why he has to learn certain techniques. This is the reason why he was on the second team. This is the reason why he needs to work on learning a new position, essentially. Absolutely. And it's, you know, like you touched on his, his transition from the weird utilization at Houston and now getting into this role. These are all luxuries that we have the opportunity to ease him in. And that, you know, when Tremaine Edmonds walked in last year, we had no one else to start at middle linebacker. There was no choice. When Trey White walked in, we had no one else at cornerback. He had to walk in and start day one. So I think that every single time they would prefer the option to bring a rookie along slowly. They don't like that. They have to do that. Mm -hmm. There are times where there's just not an obvious alternative and they want to get a look at what they have to figure that out. But you know, they would prefer this route every single time. So I, I love the the setup that they have. I think it's going to be great. I think that we have eight NFL caliber defensive linemen who are all going to um, rotate, keep each other fresh and be able to really bring, bring a lot. And you have, Trent Murphy finally healthy with a full normal offseason. Oh. You have Shaq Lawson motivated by a contract year. Um, 
I'm surprised to see it, but you have actually a pretty solid looking Mike Love in there looking really good at camp. I, I thought that was going to be Eli Harold or Eddie Yarborough, and it's really been a battle between Mike Love and seventh round pick Daryl Johnson. Um, forever, uh, quick side note every fan, put a pin in that name and don't forget that name. I'm going to make a make a projection right now that two or three years from now, Daryl Johnson is going to be a big deal and a big part of this team because once you see him in person, his frame is ridiculous. <laughs> and he, he, once we get some NFL, um, you know, workout plans and nutrition in front of him that he's going to be able to, to get himself set up long-term, he is going to be a really special presence in this team. Is that why you think love was able to do what he's doing now? Like that it's, not really shocking because he had a full off season to prepare for the role that he would been asked to play. I think it matters. You, you yeah. brought it up earlier about um, Cody Ford and that the rookies going into this, they spend a whole off season learning how to do the combine, not how to work on NFL technique mm -hmm. and that, there's an entire workout program set of how to do the three cone drill and how to do the short shuttle and how to get your best start time on the 40. So you get a good 10 yard split and how to get the most bench reps and very few of those things directly correlate to football. And that, that doesn't mean that there's not value in being a good athlete and that it's not a good baseline, but spending all of your time and energy just focusing on those techniques isn't the same thing on top of the fact that you get very little rest and recovery time. So I think getting into that um, scenario in your, from your rookie year into your second year, um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to be able to, uh, to be able to now set yourself up. And Mike Love is a perfect scenario. Ray Ray McLeod is another one yeah. in that I, I didn't think anything of him. And you can't read a training camp recap without some love for, for Ray Ray McLeod. And that was weird for me to kind of register in my brain. And I, I did a 53 man projection and I didn't have Corey Thompson on that team. I didn't have Ray Ray McLeod on that team. I didn't have Mike Love on that team. All three are second year players who had a chance to have a full off season in an NFL program, only work on their technique and their playbook. Now we're coming in and really showing out in, in their neck, their second training camp when all of us had the shiny new toy of the undrafted free agent that we assumed it was going to be, you know, uh, Dodson at linebacker or David Sills at receiver or Daryl Johnson or, or uh, Eli Harold at, um, defensive end and it's actually been the second year guy coming in carving out a role because they're used to what's going on and it, i don't think you can look see a better example that obviously that does matter i think what that does greg and I, i'm sure you'll agree with this as well it's it's it goes to show you about how the bills are set up how the infrastructure of their offseason program and the things that they want to do and the thing guys that are getting they're getting self-motivated guys who you know, okay, they go through a year. Maybe they didn't have the year that they wanted to have, but then they come in the set following year. Like, Listen, all right, wait. He they just drafted this guy. They just signed this guy. They said, no, that's my spot. No, this is my spot. Um, so that's from that perspective. I mean, you make a great point to see what the Bills' offseason has been and what they're able to do, and the things that they're able to accomplish with this team. That being said, Greg, uh, I can't thank you enough for. Uh, taking time out of your day. I know you're a busy man to come on to hashtag sports and talk uh, with about all the big uglies in the front with the offensive line and defensive line at Oliver and Cody Ford and all those guys and what's going to happen before you go though. I just want to ask you really quick uh, with the preseason game coming up Thursday, what are some things that you're looking for, for from the Buffalo bills in that game? So my number one priority in every single preseason game is please Lord, don't let anybody get hurt. So let, let's start with that. That's my baseline is I just want to walk away from every single preseason game saying, please, sweet baby Jesus, don't let anybody get hurt. Um, beyond that, um, I'd like to see, you know, I, I'd like to see a little bit here. I think that the preseason is going to be more fun for Buffalo Bills fans this year because of the depth that Brandon Bean has built in that, you know, we're not going to see a lot of Josh Allen. We're probably not going to see any LaShawn McCoy or Frank Gore. Um, we're not going to see a ton of Tremaine Edmonds and, and Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. But what's fun is 
hey, it might be a little interesting to watch Tyree Jackson play quarterback. It might be kind of fun seeing some live reps of Ray Ray McLeod and Victor Bolden and Isaiah McKenzie and Cam Phillips and David (laughs) Sills and Duke Williams. You know, we have like five or six guys fighting for the sixth wide receiver spot that, I mean, I'm not exaggerating at all. Out of those five or six guys, I won't be shocked if four of them are on other NFL rosters after we make cuts. Oh, no. You know, I think a lot of them have a chance to do that. Um, I'm kind of excited for the fact that we're going to see some extended run of guys like Lade Ren Waddle and Wyatt Teller. And then that means the guys getting reps after that, Vlad Dukas, Russell Bodine, Connor McDermott, guys who were making this roster last year, those are the guys playing preseason third quarter snaps. We had to look pretty darn good. Um, yep. The same guys I was talking about on the defensive line, you know, Eli Harold, Daryl, Daryl Johnson, Eddie Yarborough, uh, you know, all those guys you're talking about, that's defensive linemen five or defensive end five, six, and seven. So we ought to look pretty good in some of these preseason games. I want to see Voshan Joseph. I want to see Jaquan Johnson. I want to see a lot of those guys that are kind of suppressed down the depth chart and getting a handful of second and third team reps. And when you're in, um training camp you know they're they're getting short snippets and it's usually very specific scenarios i'm excited to see some of those guys play and and get some real playing time and uh you know kind of find out what we have here yeah exactly paul and i have talked about many times on the the hashtag sports episodes that okay the players that were here that were good enough to be on a six and ten team bills fans prepare yourself these players may not be here for where they're trying to go as far as to be a playoff caliber team. And we understand that. I'm very interested to see what the Bills come out, how the rotations are. Obviously, it's going to be very vanilla. You're not going to see too many uh, secrets divulge with what goes on with the Buffalo Bills. But it's great to see uh, the amount of depth they've been able to accumulate and the quality of depth. And, you know, a lot of these guys that were like second, third teamers now are fighting for a roster spot. And that's all attributed to what Bean and McDermott have been able to build here in Buffalo. So... Yeah, it's exciting, man. It's, it's uh, we should really start to see the fruits of those labors uh, this preseason where we see how competitive we should be in the middle and late parts of preseason games where before our entire roster was undrafted free agents and bottom of the barrel uh, guys that nobody else wanted. And now I think, hell, I've, I've joked about this for a long time. Cut down day on Bill's Mafia Twitter is going to be a disaster because there <laughs> there are going to be so many oh my favorite dude just got cut arguments that yeah. it's going to be hysterical there are going to be so many stands out there for can't believe that we cut uh, david so- sills or dodson or lafayette pitts or whoever your guy is and there's going to be an awful lot of talented guys who get released that when we release there's going to be one or two surprise ones of uh wyatt teller or jason croom or hell saran neal or you know guys that we think highly of that there's going to be a surprise or two come cut day and people are going to lose their minds and it's going to be the hysterical and a wonderful problem we haven't had in a long time. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of hashtag nation, this is Greg Tom said he was uh, nice enough to devote his time to hashtag sports today. Please give him a follow. His Twitter handles right above his head. Please go follow him. He has some great content. He has some witty banter on, on Twitter as well. Um, I try to behave myself. Oh, they're, they're no, they're hilarious. Just keep it up. Just keep it up. But uh, on behalf of hashtag nation, thank you for joining us today. And we will be talking with you very soon, Greg. Yeah, man, I, I appreciate it. It's it's funny. I think some people in the Bills Mafia and media worlds get very protectionist and, and like there's different rival gangs and stuff. And the awesome part about Bills Mafia is there's such an insatiable appetite for content that there's room for everybody. So I, I really appreciate the fact you guys brought us on here and able to have fun and, and uh, work together, have a good time here. So I, I appreciate it and hope everybody has a good time. And uh, we'll, we'll see you guys on Twitter. We'll see you guys out at training camp. We'll see you at the, uh, the practices and the preseason games and looking forward to a great season. Awesome. Take it easy.